I got to make sure I don't run over time. Um, when Steve was talking about the uh, attention span that people have for poetry, I was thinking, this is bad news for me. Man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get your attention anyway. Uh, and, and thanks to, to everybody. I mean, I do feel that I, I should say this because I mean it sincerely. Uh, thanks, Tom, for having me here. Thanks, Ginger. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for doing Atlanta Review. And thank you, poets, for reading with me. And thank you guys for being here. Uh, I want to start off with a poem that is from the Atlanta Review. Uh, it's called Naming Our Boy. Oh, I better do the reading glasses thing. It's, it's about that time in life. Naming Our Boy. The jokes come first. Smegma and pustule, Ritalin, and Excremento Alexander. All names applied to genitals must go. Forget Peter Richard Lance. <laughs> Ditto Willie, John Thomas, and if the OBGYN was wrong, Virginia. <laughs> Kids can mock anything. Still, easy targets, Dudley to Dud, Ferdinand to Turdenhand should be shunned. Two common names and trendy ones must be avoided. Even Jason, which I've always liked, Golden Fleece and all. Charles might do, but I'm a junior. The third is unthinkable. Relatives' names must be respectfully considered, and those two antiquated, earnest, silly, Mortimer, historically undesirable, Adolf, <laughs> respectfully culled. Puns on my last name, spider web, world wide web, Webster web, foot web, can be ruled out. Also, names with bad associations Tim, my wife's ex boyfriend, <laughs> Don, the junkie organist who wrecked my band. <laughs> Artistic names, Tallulah, Rumor, Dweezil, Susquehanna, I leave to celebrities. Why send a kid to school with kick me on his back? <laughs> Neologisms, latrine, say, or derail, earn the axe. Combining my wife's name with mine creates Chaka, too like Chucker, and Kacha, too like Gotcha and Kachu. I place my hands on my wife's belly and gather psychic hunches. Watermelon? <laughs> Hindenburg? <laughs> English speakers can't name children, makes a mint, or towers overall, so we weigh etymologies, seeking a name that even when he's filled his diapers, he'll hear subliminally. Aren't you ashamed, noble hero? <laughs> And no, he's more than what he's done. My genes hope he'll do what I could not. Play big league baseball. Catch tarpon on a fly. I hope there'll still be tarpon. Win the Yale Series of Younger Poets Prize. They hope his Kerry Cronenberg will go around with him. I hope his name will conjure qualities, health, good looks, brains, determination, luck, that may spare him some hardships and get him something akin to what he wants. I hope he'll thank me the way I thank my dad, who in three big Canada honkers dropped toward the blind he'd built for us, touched my arm, and whispered, your shot, son. <laughs> oh, thanks, 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 thanks. Uh, <laughs> It's nice to hear the applause, but I always worry about when it doesn't come. So I, I'm going to steal a line from David St. John, which is, which is, unless you're just like wild to do it, I don't want to suppress anybody, but you can hold the applause and then go crazy at the end. <laughs> uh, this, is, uh, this is another poem about names. And uh, Tom picked this for plowshares, and I like to read it, so it seemed like the right thing to do. Uh, I was reading the Bible, as I often do, and, dis and realized that there's an awful lot of strange sounding names that only come up once. So I wrote this poem called Biblical Also Rans. <laughs> 
Hanok, Palu, Hezron, Carmi, Jemuel, Ohad, Zohar, Shuni. One Genesis mentions all you got. Zephion, Muppam, Arodi, lost in a list even the most devout skip over. Like, s <laughs> good audience. <laughs> like small towns on the road to L.A. <laughs> How tall were you, Shalim? <laughs> what was your favorite color? Ard. <laughs> Did you love your wife? Ayab. <laughs> Not even her name survives. Adam, Eve, Abel, Cain, these are the stars crowds surge to see. Each hour, thousands of Josephs, Jacobs, Benjamins are born. How many Oholibamas? <laughs> How many Mizahs draw first breath today? Gatam, Kanaz, Ruel, sidemen in the band. Waiters who bring the Perignon and disappear. Yet they loved Dawn's garnet light as much as Moses did. They drank wine with as much delight. I thought my life would line me up with Samuel, Isaac, Joshua. Instead, I stand with Bazemoth, Hagla, Amihud. Theirs are the names I honor. Theirs the deaths I feel. Their children's tears loud as any on the corpse of Abraham. Their smiles as mist, the earth as desolate without them. Pebbles on a hill, crumbs carried off by ants. Jeush, Dishan, Nahath, Shama. Uh, okay. <laughs> You couldn't help yourself. <laughs> uh, I, was, uh, I was reading about, well, I'm, I'm a baseball nut. I love baseball. And, and I was reading an, an article about the Negro Leagues. And I was reminded in that article about a game that they used to play called Shadow Ball. And I'd heard about it before, but I forgot about it. The poem will tell you what Shadow Ball is. But I thought it was such a fantastic metaphor that, that I just grabbed it, and I didn't have to do much else. Uh, this is Shadow Ball. Let's say some black guys in the 30s hustled up a baseball game. Then right away, this tree trunk armed Josh Gibson type lambasted their one soggy spalding with its cover falling off past the sarsaparillas into Okie slough. Next play, the pitcher wound up and threw a fat nothing. The batter swung and smoked a low line drive the shortstop blocked and fired to the first baseman who did a split and scooped nothing out of the dirt just as the runner banged the bag. Out, roared the umpire and both benches cleared. The Pittsburgh Crawfords, Birmingham Black Barons, New York Black Yankees, even the Indianapolis Clowns beat the best white teams at real baseball. Still, before a game, they'd whip around the horn that spherical hunk of the void they knew so well, slamming it deep, chasing it down so skillfully few whites who saw them guessed the trick. Black folks were shadows to most white ones anyway. Though we whites pioneered the shadow services for which government is famed, and the shadow intelligence displayed inside high offices across the land. Not to mention shadow marriage, where couples make real mortgage payments to shadow companies for shadow homes, have shadow sex, and before they sleep with shadow partners say, I love you, without the shadowiest notion what they mean. 
which is why their kids prefer the well-lit screens of movies and the World Wide Web to baseball, and professional theorists swear there's no real life, real meaning, real excellence, real, real, and the most enlightened answer to good night is good is a race, class, gender determined abstraction. And it's not night, the sky just looks that way. <laughs> yes, it looks darker every day. Those Negro League all-stars, Oscar Charleston, Willie Wells, Buck Leonard, cool Papa Bell, who couldn't stay in white hotels, eat in white restaurants, or play in the so-called major leagues, but who apparently enjoyed life anyway, can be forgiven if they laugh in their all-black graveyards to see shadows reach out black gloves and grab us all. <laughs> Okay, uh, everybody knows, or everybody who's seen them knows, that blurbs on poetry books tend to exaggerate the importance of the poet, except in my case, of course, <laughs> and, and also the poetry. But when I read a blurb that said, quote, and I'm quoting, when the last stars have burned out, <laughs> <laughs> We will read these poems for consolation. <laughs> I went off, and while there was still light, <laughs> I wrote this poem, which is called, after Magritte, Ceci n'est pas un poème, this is not a poem. <laughs> Say poem, and the wrong images appear. Beatniks bent over bongos, kids reciting, sullen, baffled, bored. A frail esthete who coughs blood into his long, perfumed hair as it whips in some mistral or semoon. Say poem. And words in powdered wigs mince down parallel halls, rhymes tin bell clanging in the hindmost's hand. Forget that. I want you to hear dusk 1980, mothers up and down candlelight lane singing their sons in from home run derby to dinner. Forget the egomaniacs who liken their own chattering to wine, food, sex, or dynamite and offer when the last stars have burned out, not flashlights, poems as <laughs> consolation. <laughs> I want you to taste hot French bread and cool Chablis with a beautiful stranger. I want you to feel blown apart by love, then reassembled under star-strewn skies. Your consolation lies beside you. Forget me. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, this is odd. Let's see. Here is a poem. I think I've left half of my poems down there. I mean, is there, is there like more under that thing? <laughs> Thank you. See, I got a whole book here I can read to you. <laughs> this is what you call preparation. Uh, this is a poem that, that's from my first uh, book, Reading the Water. Not so funny. Uh, whenever I get up in front of an audience, I tend to do funnier poems because, frankly, it's fun to hear people laugh, and, and uh, I like to do it. Th but this one isn't funny. There might be a couple of funny things in it, but certainly by the end, I hope you're not hysterical. Uh, I'm serious. It's not funny. This is <laughs> it's the last laugh, okay? This is called, and it's unfortunately a true story, Prayer for the Man Who Mugged My Father, 72. If you're a person who doesn't like violence, you might hold your ears. May there be an afterlife. May you meet him there, the same age as you. May the meeting take place in a small, locked room. May the bushes where you hid be there again, leaves tipped with razor blades and acid. May the rifle butt you bashed him with be in his hand. May the glass in his car window, which you smashed as he sat stopped at a red light, be embedded in the rifle butt 
and on the floor to break your fall. May the needles the doctors use to close his eye stab your pupils every time you hit the wall and then the floor, which will be often. May my father let you cower for a while, whimpering, please don't shoot me, please. May he laugh, unload your gun, toss it away. Then may he take you with bare hands. May those hands which taught his son to throw a curve and drive a nail and hold a frog feel like cannonballs against your jaw. May his arms which powered handstands and made their muscles jump to please me, wrap your head and grind your face like stone. May his chest, thick and hairy as a bear's, feel like a bear's, snapping your bones. May his feet, which showed me the flutter kick and carried me miles through the woods, feel like axes crushing your one claim to manhood as he chops you down. And when you are down and he's done with you, which will be soon, since even one-eyed with brain damage, he's a merciful man. May the door to the room open and let him stride away to the Valhalla he deserves. May you, bleeding, broken, drag yourself upright. May you think the worst is over, you've survived, and may still win. Then may the door open once more and let me in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, how am I doing for time here? I always have so many more that I that I want to read than I, than I can. Uh, my latest book uh, is Hot Popsicles. It's is prose poems, which can mean a lot of different things, but in my case, it means actually a little strange stories a lot of the time, some stranger than others. This is one from that book um, that started like a lot of my poems start as, as a kind of funny conceit, something I thought, oh, wouldn't it be weird if this were true? And, the, and, the, and then it turns darker, as, it, as often happens. Uh, and this one began with just the thought that what if Superman what if his body was invulnerable, but his mind aged just like other people's? And so I wrote this poem called Superman Old. He can still fly and squeeze coal into diamonds and see through walls and women's clothes, but sometimes speeding through clouds, he loses control and tumbles like a spent bullet end over end or forgets where he's going and has to take a taxi home. He lives alone, Clark Kent, retired reporter, but believes spies sneak into his room and steal his shoes. Old daily planets heap up in his hall. The health department calls about cockroaches. He shoves the inspector through a wall. When Jimmy Olsen dies, then Perry White, he wants to die too but Earth lacks kryptonite. Three knives shatter on his wrists, eight bullets of ascending caliber ping off his skull. He jumps in front of a train. It derails, killing 50. <laughs> he walks away. His tantrums topple tall buildings. The SWAT team sent for him retreats with casualties. The CIA finds Lois in a nursing home. Kidneys shot and colon gone. She says she'll help. A helicopter lowers her wheelchair into the rubble where Superman sleeps. She leans down to stroke his cheek. Superman, it's me. He jerks upright, eyes baffled. Who are you? I'm your mother, Superman, she lies. His brow softens. I missed you, Mom. Do you remember Lois Lane? He scrunches up his face, still young and handsome as a boy's. Kind of, he says. She was pretty. Lex Luthor has her, up there. Lois points at Cassiopeia, glittering. Can you see her? Superman squints. I don't know. She takes his hand, still strong as steel. 
Lois needs you, Superman. You've got to save her. Lois, he whispers and stands. She straightens his cape. Who are you? he asks. Your mother, Superman. Save Lois, please. Save Lewis, he says. Stretching hands above his head, he bends his knees. Fly, Clark, she says, then grips his cape and lets his leap yank her up out of her wheelchair. Her heart slows as the air thins, then it stops. Her hands relax, and she falls like the last booster of a rocket that, an instant later, begins tumbling end over end toward its home in the stars. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to do another prose poem here. Uh, for those of you, I'm from L.A., not really, I'm really from Houston, but I, but I live in L.A. now. And uh, we have a governor out there. Uh, and, and you guys know who he is, I'm sure. But this, this poem was written before he was governor. It was, it was written, in fact, when I was uh, just a fan of the comic book, Conan the Barbarian. Uh, but I changed it a little bit in honor of Arnold. Conan the Barbarian waited politely in his best suit for his turn to board the Greyhound, L.A. bound. He picked two seats toward the rear, sprawled over both, and faked deep sleep. Five minutes later, the bus eased into the rainy night with Conan sitting pretty. Lots of leg room and no neighbor to disrupt his reading practice. Conan had gone civilized. He didn't miss Stygian ale. He didn't miss Red Sonia or Belit, queen of the black coast. He liked his MasterCard, The Tonight Show, Money Magazine. He switched on his reading light. Nothing. He switched on the light above his extra seat. Still nothing. All over the bus, happy people were switching on their reading lights, settling back to pass the long hours profitably, pleasurably, while he sat swathed in gloom. There was not one other empty seat. Well, they can't blame me this time, Conan growled as he loosened his tie, stood, and reached into his golf bag for his sword. <laughs> okay. All right, here's, here's another poem uh, from the Atlanta Review. This one apparently is going to be in Best American Poetry uh, next time, so if you don't rush right out and buy everything that, I, that I've published right now, you can find it then. Uh, it, it was inspired by another poet. Um, poetry really is a conversation, one poet to another poet, sometimes over many centuries, sometimes, you know, over dinner. Uh, but th this poet's name is Suzanne Paola, and she wrote a poem called Prayer to Seal Up the Womb Door. And th and it, it was basically saying that because people are, have wrecked the planet, we shouldn't have any more kids. I, I don't even think she believes that. I mean, you can write something that you don't believe, because she apparently has a couple of children. But at any rate, I mean, I just took that one and ran with it because I was in the process of being about to, to have my first one, or my wife was anyway. Uh, and uh, this, this starts with an epigraph. The, from Suzanne, Suzanne Paola. Because we need to remember that memory will end, let the womb remain untouched. The poem is called Prayer to Tear the Sperm Dam Down. Because we know our lives will end, let the vagina host a huge party and let the penis come. <laughs> let it come nude without a raincoat. Let it come rich and leave with coffers drained. Throw the prostate's floodgates open. Let sperm crowd the womb full as a World Cup stadium. Let them flip and wriggle like a mackerel shoal. Let babies leap into being like atoms after the Big Bang. 
Let's celebrate fullness, roundness, gravidity. Let's worship generation, this one and the next and next forever. Let's adore the progression, protozoan to guppy to salamander to slow loris to Shakespeare. Forget Caligula, forget Hitler, mistakes were made. Let's celebrate our own faces, grinning back at us across 10,000 years. Let's get this straight. Earth doesn't care if it's overrun. If it's green or brown or black, rainforest, desert, or ice pack. A paper mill is sweet as lavender to Earth which has no sense of smell and doesn't care if roads gouge it or industries fume into its air. Beetles don't care, or crows, or whales, despite their singing and big brains. Sure, rabbits feel. Spicebush swallowtails feel their probosity slide into flowers' honey pots, which may feel too, but lack the brains to care. Even if beagles are mournful as they look, even if great apes grieve, wage war, catch termites with twigs, and say in sign language, caca on your head, <laughs> they still don't care. Or if they do, well, join the club. We humans care so much, some of us dub life a veil of tears and see heaven as oblivion. Some pray for Earth's sake not to be reborn. Wake up. Earth will be charred by the exploding sun, blasted to dust, reduced to quarks, and still not care. If some people enjoy their lives too much to share, let them not share. If some despise themselves too much to reproduce, let them disappear. If some perceive themselves as a disease, let them take the cure and go extinct. It's immaterial to Earth. Let people realize this or not. Earth doesn't care. I do, and celebrate my own fecundity. I celebrate my wife's ovaries, her fallopian tubes down which, like monthly paychecks, gold eggs roll. I celebrate the body's changing. Might as well, it changes anyway. I celebrate gestation, water breaking, the dash to the hospital, the staff descending, malpractice policies in hand. I celebrate dilation of the cervix, doctors in green scrubs, and even, since I won't get one, the episiotomy. <laughs> I celebrate my bloody, dripping son, head deformed by thrusting against the world's door. Let it open wide for him. Let others make room for him. Let his imagination shine like God's. Let his caring change the face of everything. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, well, I had a couple more I wanted to read, but you guys have been a fantastic audience. So, uh, and, and you've, it is hot in here. So I'm going to end with one more. This one, you know, I, I was going to separate that one from this other one about my son. I seem to write a lot about him lately because this guy's so miraculous that he exists. But uh, this is one that I only realized, Steve, as you read that wonderful poem about your magic trick and Mary, that I talk about poetry being a, a, a conversation, and you mentioned being inspired by one of my poems, I realized that the feeling of the end of this poem comes right from you. I, that's a public confession, and I had no idea it was true. And it even has some of the cadence. So thank you, Steve. But it, luckily, I looked at it quickly. It, it's not your words exactly. <laughs> or, I, or I would have had to, had to scrap it. Uh, my, my boy's seven now. It takes a while for these poems to catch up. But uh, he's about two in this one. It's called Flashlight. Thank you very, very much for your attention. I mean, seriously, you guys are great. Flashlight. Point, push the switch, and a circle of light leaps onto the wall. My two-year-old leaps at the sight, hands stretched skyward, shrilling, yite! Imagine you're riding a beam of it, I say. You go so fast, time stops, and your body turns into light. Yite! Yite! He screams and springs for mine. Yes, light, I say. Can you believe it goes 186,000 miles per second? 
that's in a vacuum. In more solid mediums, it slows. Not much, though, unless you're talking Bose-Einstein condensate. It won't outrun a moped then. Do lights flash on in my boy's head? I've dreamed of passing nature's secrets on to him, our own two-man bucket brigade. I give him now the inside scoop on lasers and photons, refraction and rainbows. Light-deprived people get depressed, I say, and describe light's wave particle behavior and speak the great incantation E equals MC squared. Yite, yite, he wails <laughs> and starts to cry. I could cry too, thinking of atom bombs. So I explain how batteries excite electrons in the bulb's filament to higher levels from which they fall, releasing bursts of light. My boy falls to the floor, screaming, not with delight. He calms when I hand him the flashlight. Hope, he quavers, meaning help. I slide the switch. A white hole flames onto the rug. My boy crows, yite, and sweeps the hole across the room. Yite, yite. He grips the bulb and sees his skin turn red. Is that from blood? I've never known. Dada, he cries, and orbiting the beam around my head, follows me outside under stars remote as the chance that he would ever, from the infinite dark, flame down to me, carrying such radiance, such yite. <laughs> Thank you.